I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I'd like to also, if I could, now segue into my you know, formal uh, prepared talk, as it were, uh, about, wow, how to be with the uh, often turbulent times and challenging times we find ourselves in these days. Okay? All right. So I did a podcast earlier today with Forrest that we'll probably post in a few weeks. Uh, I don't know what the title will be, uh, but basically it's about how to deal with anxiety, about large-scale forces that seem out of control, political upheaval, institutions falling apart, global warming, economic change, um, nuclear weapons, AI, that stuff. And so I'm going to actually name it. <laughs> not to freak you out. Fear not. This is not going to be a new show. I just want to name what a lot of people feel as a kind of anxiety, which is interesting at a time that historically has, is safer, healthier, wealthier, more knowledgeable, more regulated in good ways than at any other time in human history. Why are we anxious? So I'd like to dive into this topic here. And um, since it starts, it could sort of overlap politics. Uh, I especially encourage you, please, to follow my uh, admonitions that if you use the chat, you focus on your own experience, what life is like for you. And you avoid challenging the experience of others, trying to talk people out of their experience, um, trying to educate others, persuade others, teach others, criticize others. <sighs> you know what I'm talking about. And I've done every single one of those things. So I know what you're doing if you do it, because I've done it myself. Don't do it. Okie doke. Here we go. So <clears throat> I want to name three categories, and I want to invite you into finding what fits for you. <clears throat> the first category is that we're worried about things that we really don't need to be worried about, truly don't need to be worried about, because maybe some of what we think is true is not true. If you just sort of randomly wander through Twitter, which I spend a, you know, a certain amount of time on, I would say, political Twitter, there are wild claims about reality that you know and I know are not really true. And so many of these claims about reality are, are alarmist and taken out of context. Wow, <laughs> you know, that's what I, I call delusional anxiety. We're worried about stuff that's just not, it's just not true. Or very often the case is that we habituate to sources of security because they become familiar and we don't have anything to compare them to. So we don't appreciate how actually secure uh, we are in many, many kinds of ways that can uh, offset and compensate for and help us deal with some of the things that are general, genuinely worrisome. All right? That's the first category. I'm really interested in the second and third categories. The second category is stuff in the world that has always been bad, worrisome, threatening, horrible. And yet people in previous times did not have the communication systems and the technologies to be aware of it. So they were blissfully ignorant. Like think about people in ancient Rome 2,000 years ago uh, who, you know, did not have any idea <laughs> the barbarians were marching toward the gates. 
blissfully ignorant. They did not have any idea that volcanoes were erupting somewhere else in the world that was going to put so much dust in the atmosphere that it led to crop failures and famines in a year or two to come. They just had no idea. But these days, with 24-7 news, people being really dialed in, we're just aware of all these things that might have consequences for us, because they, they really might have consequences for us. But our parents and grandparents, and especially great-grandparents, had no way of knowing about this stuff, so they weren't bothered by it. That's a, that's a category. That's a way to understand why we are worried and kind of sometimes really the sense of dread in the belly. That seems so out of proportion. You know, in America, the Dow Jones is soaring. Unemployment is an historic low. All these good things are happening. And yet, and yet, and yet, here and around the world, so many people feel really, particularly young people, feel really anxious. And it, it's not the t typical anxiety about, can I get a job? Can I find love? Uh, can we make a baby? Um, you know, it's, it's anxiety about systemic forces, large scale systemic forces that could be harmful. All right? And these things are real. I want to be really clear with you as I move through these categories. Global warming is real. The risk of nuclear war is real. I'm not trying to freak you out, but I mean, these things are real. Uh, the, the incredibly rapid development of AI and the ways it could be misused for military purposes, surveillance purposes, you know, these things are real. The fact that people of our children's generation um, have a much harder time buying a home than their parents did for all kinds of reasons. Uh, college education is much more expensive today. Uh, things that people of my generation kind of took for granted or were able to ride, tremendous acceleration of wealth development in much of the world that's starting to taper off for everybody kind of below the top 1% of 1%. Um, those are real things. Those are real things. You know, um, the rise of authoritarianism in Europe, in America. Uh, we see it in recent elections, um, certainly in Venezuela and elsewhere. Uh, it's real stuff. So I'm not here to bang a drum and say, you all should be freaked out. I'm basically saying, hey, if you're already freaked out, there's a reason for it. And I want to explore Buddhist principles about how to practice with it. Okay. And then there's the third um, category of basically unprecedented sources of anxiety unprecedented. And these you could put into two categories. Um, unprecedented factors like global warming, which three, four, five hundred years ago was not a thing. Um, unprecedented categories that can be worrisome. And also the ways in which just being bombarded by endless information streams and fast pay, even positive information, just fast paced, constantly changing information is really disturbing to the nervous system, independent of the content that the information stream is carrying. All right, so what do we do about all this? What would the Buddha say? Okay. Um, I offer several highlights from uh, the teachings of the Buddha for your consideration. And I really invite your reflection and discussion here. Uh, you can put your observations in the chat. Please follow my guidelines. Don't give lectures. Focus on your own experiences, what's helpful to you. Um, perhaps your own history. Uh, so first off, the Buddha profoundly emphasized clear seeing, recognizing what is true. You may know the term vipassana. A lot of uh, us, me included, have been trained in a kind of vipassana tradition that 
to, went from early Buddhism through Southeast Asia and now into America, sometimes called insight. It's about clear seeing, recognizing, um, bowing at the altar of reality. So we want to see these things clearly. Real stuff is real stuff. And unreal stuff is unreal stuff. And know the difference. What's real? What, what is the state of democracy in your country? Um, what are the sources of growing national debt? You don't have to be a scholar you know, to recognize what's real. You know, what are time-tested, effective approaches when a plague starts sweeping through the human species? What's true? Recognizing what's true. Knowing for yourself what's true. Standing up for the truth. Standing against people who would deliberately spew disinformation, misinformation, and outright lies. We don't always get it right, but we can trust those who, when they get it wrong, admit it, and then try to get it right. So you may recall that the personification of evil in the early mythology of Buddhism was Mara, the trickster, the deceiver. So there's a tremendous emphasis in Buddhism about knowing what the facts are, knowing what is actually the case. Know what is actually the case. It's, it's not less than what is really true, but it's not more than what is really true. That's a deeply Buddhist principle. Uh, by the way, the article I mentioned that I wrote that lists these eight factors of steepening your learning curve learning broadly stated, uh, is called learning to learn from positive experiences. I would have preferred the word beneficial in the title because positive experiences can be on a you know fast track to, oh, just be positive. Uh, I don't mean that at all. Uh, but you know it made sense, particularly since it was published in the Journal of Positive Psychology. So, okay, right? Primary Buddhist principle. Find refuge in your recognition of what's true. As best you can, five minutes a day, five minutes a day, what's true? Second, deconstruct, tease apart the elements of things. So much of Buddhist meditative training is about recognizing the compounded nature of our experiences and all phenomena in general. They're made of parts that are made of parts that are made of parts all of which are in relationship with each other and changing. So I already have sorted things into three parts. Four, actually. Um, Large-scale forces that we really don't need to be worried about for various reasons, because they don't exist, or they're managed by positive developments over the last centuries, millennia. Second category, uh, things that were always worrisome and bad, but we just didn't know about because we didn't have modern information systems and communication systems, th second category. And then third category, unprecedented, new sources of threat to humanity in general and often to us in particular. Okay, That's a sorting device. That's helpful to sort that out. Third, the Buddha really honored all aspects of our experience. So what are the many aspects of experience that we have? Rather than numbing out or swerving away, you know, turning away, how do you feel? When you look at the paper, when you see various uh, leaders worldwide making statements about this or that, when you uh, know more and more of what the facts are, how do you feel? And rather than going numb or suppressing it, the Buddha encouraged us to open to it all. Nothing left out, as a Zen saying. Zen happened after the Buddha. But throughout, for example, the four foundations of mindfulness or the four establishments of mindfulness, there's an emphasis on recognizing everything. For example, in meditations on the body, there's an emphasis on recognizing the mortality of the body 
and including our fears of dying. Um, in the third foundation of mindfulness, it's about recognizing whether you know our consciousness broadly is colored by greed or not, colored by hatred or not, uh, colored by delusion or not, broadly. So we want to take it all into account. And this goes to what I think is a really useful and important point, which is to differentiate between anxiety and grief. So to um, continue this sort of sorting things into different boxes or categories or teasing apart, untangling the knottedness of the mind, we can be worried about things that could affect us directly. Like, huh, as a younger person who would love to own a home, how do I actually do that with, with property values and parts of the world in which I'd want to live rising? Um, or if you're a person in a country and you happen to be Jewish and there's rising anti-Semitism, that's a large-scale force. It affects you personally. If you're a woman in a country um, that is restricting access to uh, reproductive health and control over your own body, um, that could affect you personally. Then there is worry about things that could harm those we care about. Um, you know, worry about impact of the economy and other people, worry about the impact of global warming on other species that are headed for extinction due to human causes, tragically. You know, it helps to kind of sort this out. Okay, this is what I'm worried about me, and then this is how I'm worried about us. And then with that, uh, there can be a kind of grief about a future for oneself that um, is less and less likely or is harder and harder to attain. There can also be the grief not just about the loss of a personal future, but the future of others in a, for example, gradually warming world. And there can be certainly grief about the loss going forward for countless generations uh, of um, driving species to extinction or um, heating up the planet for generations, for hundreds of generations to come. There can be these things. It's helpful to sort these out. The sorting it out actually opens us to it to these sources and over time helps us bear them because as we as the buddha advises disentangle the knots in the mind we let in air and light and space which helps us bear them and be wise about them increasingly so it's helpful to do this for yourself to find what it is that you are concerned about as to grief The Buddha, in effect, had two practices that are implicit in um, the, uh, the widely known tale of the woman who lost a baby and was advised to seek a medicine made of uh, mustard seeds from homes that had not known loss. And she could not find any homes that had not known loss, so she returned to the Buddha and he pointed this out to her in terms of our common humanity in grief. And we're not alone in our grief. Others are losing too. Uh, we do not make it through this life without loss. Suzuki Roshi said, you know, uh, living is like setting sail in a boat that you know will eventually sink. Uh, the five reflections in Tibetan Buddhism include, you know, is it given to me to avoid losing everything I love one way or another, you know, through their passing or my own. So, you know, we're not alone in our grief. That's helpful to appreciate. And that's the teaching of the Buddha very explicitly in that story. And I think there's another teaching that's implicit in that story. 
This mother was racked with grief, understandably, because she loved her child. Grieving is loving. We don't grieve the loss of things we don't value. We grieve the loss of what we love, including the future that we understandably thought we could have or that we would wish for others. And turning to the loving through the Buddhist teachings, the metta practice of loving kindness, uh, his emphasis on compassion and kindness and a generous happiness for others as three of the four um, divine dwelling places for the heart. Right? If you want to know where to rest, you know, what is rest your mind on what your heart longs for, um, you know, compassion, kindness, and a generous happiness for the welfare of others, good places to rest in. He advocated that. And turning into love, turning toward love, finding the love that underlies the grief, even the love that underlies the worry, and being aware of it, being aware of that love as you feel the grief can help it can help us bear the grief. It's a lot easier to bear that grief, including a grief about the state of the world. It's because we love the world that we that we grieve the harms being done to it. And then I'll finish on this point. Um, and by the way, the the fourth category uh, that I alluded to, I just want to name, I mean more the kind of ordinary anxieties of everyday life, uh, not having to do with large-scale social, systemic, structural factors, um, daily life. Um, and I should, so I wanted to name that. And then also for sure in terms of large-scale factors, uh, there are the ones that others bear that you don't, perhaps and I'm speaking now for myself, um, I have not had to bear uh, or deal with um, s systemic factors such as racism or sexism or, I don't know what to call it, um, prejudice against uh, people who are gay, uh, lesbian, transsexual as well. Um, and so these two are things that sometimes we have to take into account both as they affect us and as they affect others. Um, girls and women worldwide um, have come a long way, well overdue, uh, and they still are subjugated and mistreated routinely throughout the world, including in my own country, um, certainly, to deal with that. So the last point I want to finish with is has to do with, again, a very Buddhist emphasis on self-reliance. If you are concerned after reflection, you are concerned about the personal impact of large-scale forces. <clears throat> Take the action you can, both to protect yourself and to do what you can in your way and to know that you've done what you can to help and to help others with those large-scale forces. Uh, I think there are a lot of people who are worried about low probability but high catastrophe events, right? Understandably, me included, but they don't take action. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're prone to catastrophic earthquakes, uh, you know, every 50 to 100 years. It's been quite a while since our last catastrophic earthquake. We're probably due for one fairly soon. People living near Mount, La um, Mount Rainier, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, that is an area that's just low probability on any given day, but eventually something big and bad is going to happen there. Uh, what do you want? How do you think about that? Um, maybe there you're you're concerned about you know not being resourced in your old age. Well, one of the most useful things we could do is save a little every day. Put a dollar in a jar. Put ten dollars in a jar every day that gradually accumulates over time. Take the action you can. Um, I think about simple things like having some water, uh, you know, having uh, some extra food, 
uh, having a go bag, having a plan if a very low likelihood but catastrophic event occurs, like certain kinds of policies uh, coming down the pipeline in your own country, or, you know, hopefully not, the use of a tactical nuclear weapon somewhere in the world. Not to freak you out, but to basically say, you know, if you're already concerned about this stuff, the Buddha was profoundly self-reliant. And he made it clear that we are the inheritors of our choices, including our choices for inaction, not acting. Um, and his last words, translated by Stephen Batchelor, were, things fall apart, tread the path with care. And it's your path that you're treading. So I don't, again, mean to be nihilistic. I mean, take the action you can. Put an umbrella in the trunk of your car. <laughs> I don't know. Put a $20 bill in the glove compartment. I'm speaking personally. I mean, if you have the privilege and the resources to do this. And then in terms of the world at large, gosh, uh, you know, there are a handful of simple things that uh, are definitely within the reach of most of us. Uh, with regard to global warming and our own personal carbon footprint, we all have a carbon footprint. The average Americans is 20 metric tons a year of greenhouse gases. Well, reduce your footprint in simple ways as best you can. That'll probably get you 10 or 20% of the way. And then if you have the means, donate 50 cents a day. That's about the cost to offset what remains or to repair what remains to very legitimate nonprofits that do carbon capture, that suck the carbon out of the sky that you unavoidably participated in releasing. For example, uh, if you live in a anywhere you are, participate in civic engagement as best you can in your country, whether it's Saudi Arabia or Sweden or the United States. You know, if you can vote, vote. Get informed, vote however you want, but participate in the process. And along the way, if you have friends and others who are low information people, they just kind of don't know what's actually true, and you know, you can direct them to things that are actually true. Uh, you might like to go to a website I put up recently uh, with some uh, friends called Heal Democracy. That's nonpartisan, and it lists very straightforward. It has two buttons on it, basically. One will take people to vote.org, which is where you can register and check your status and find your local polling booth and so forth to vote. And then the other is guides.vote, which is nonpartisan information about candidates and issues. Participate. It's not that hard. Also, in terms of the larger world, uh, the systemic forces that threaten us will not be changed by individual action. They will only be changed by collective action, by effective coalitions forming to accomplish real things. So if there are things you care about, join with others who are mobilizing and coming together to take care of them. Uh, I had a deep conversation earlier today with a woman from the Middle East who is pulling together resources for new mothers there uh, in cultures that um, are not always supportive of, um, of mothers and uh, young children. So uh, she's starting to form a network of people who really care about that and pulling together resources, including some of the things I know because that's been an early interest of mine, supporting mothers, um, you know, who are doing something real. Join with others collectively. So these are three things. If you care about the world, in terms of some of the major issues of the day, uh, we can all, in effect, um, repair the harms to the planet we cannot help participating in, in terms of greenhouse gases, we can repair those harms related to us as individuals. We can do that. We can participate in the political process and encourage others to do so. And we can start to form coalitions, alliances, networks, movements, collective action with others that it's about getting real things done. Not just wringing our hands and railing at the skies, but actually making things better very much, of course, what the Buddha did to finish here. 
uh, what did he do? He encouraged people to certainly take the individual action that they could while also really emphasizing the third jewel of practice, sangha, community, both that involves appreciating teachers and wisdom holders such as monastics and also coming together in community with others um, who have shared interests, who care about making a better world. And uh, we have broadly now a community here and we have a communities around the world that care about making things better. And that absolutely is central to the Buddha's teachings. One of the very first things he did was begin to form a community around him and a fair amount of his efforts in the Vinaya, the monastic code, applying to male and female monastics alike, although in definitely unfair ways to the female monastics of the time, um, you know, he was very interested in helping to form communities. So that's uh, the last thing that I'm talking about here. So I hope this was helpful to you in various ways. Um, my point here is to not overstate threats nor understate them. And my point here is to respond to the longing in the hearts of people to not feel so anxious about, you know, things that are that are unprecedented uh, that we're all facing today. Uh, wish you well with this. Uh, I can tell you personally uh, that I perhaps should not say this, but for myself, uh, I'm very concerned about some of the major trend lines uh, that we've talked about here. But fundamentally, I'm really hopeful for humanity, and I'm really um, hopeful for the better angels in our nature gradually prevailing, and I'm really hopeful about the fundamental um, ground of all, you know, working its way upward and outward through the human heart. And I'd like to share that hope with you.